Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2016. Brought to you by headline sponsors, Cisco, IBM, NVIDIA, and our ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. We're here concurrent with Strata and Hadoop World. James Markarian is here. He's the CTO of SnapLogic, longtime industry participant, watcher, technologist. James, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, great for having me, guys. So you, we were talking off camera, and you've got a good historical perspective, not only on Hadoop World, but on the industry in, in general. So what's happening in data management? How is it evolving? What's changed over the last five to seven years? What, what, what isn't changing? Uh, so, you know, when I think about, um, so like, as, as you know, I used to be CTO of another integration uh, company, and yeah, I, I kind of view that now as like prehistoric times. Uh, so there are like a, a few creatures kind of roaming the earth, like a, you know, a few ERP systems, a few database systems. There are a few flavors of Unix. That was a little spicy, you know, for the, for the time. Um, but now, like in the last few years, everything's just completely exploded, you know, so lots of SaaS applications, still a lot of on-premise applications and a lot of legacy. Um, and now we're seeing this like trend around changes in the database market that we hadn't seen for a while. Like so, when you look you know back even longer you know than the than the question, but like say you know ten or twenty years, you could pick you know any flavor of database that you wanted as long as it was like Oracle, IBM, or Microsoft. And now you have relational databases, you have NoSQL databases, and then you have purpose-built databases for doing analytics. So everything from like Vertica and Redshift to, you know, of course, of course, Hadoop. And it's exciting you know, for us involved in technology. It's like new. And when you look at customers, they're like, well, that's great. Now what? Um, and so I think almost everything has changed. The platforms have changed. People's expectations around what they can do with their data has changed. And the complexity has kind of gone, gone up considerably also. And that's, that's what I think is both challenging and exciting about this. Yeah, it's this certainly time. challenging for, for customers, right, to try to keep up with all this. I mean, the people part of the equation has, has made it difficult for a lot of people to get value out of the, their data. Now, it's taken maybe longer than a lot of people thought, but what's your point of view on that in terms of just the people skills that are now available to exploit data? Uh, I think it's evolving. You know, it's something that doesn't change overnight. You know, all of a sudden we didn't, in IT, just sort of mint, you know, so-called data scientists. You know, we were talking about, like, Jeff Hammerbacher earlier. There's just not a lot of guys like that floating around that really just sort of, you know, intuitively through experience, you know, have the technical skill and the business uh, angle to actually take advantage of it. So, you know, I, I kind of describe like the early days of Hadoop. You know, I, I've been breaking everything down into equations lately, which makes me very like fun at parties. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so basically, you know, the you know, equation that everyone was sold on for Hadoop and like was, look, you have cheaper hardware and you have cheaper software, then like pick your favorite like former analytic database or data warehousing database. It's like, this is obvious. It's like, well, okay, let's add a few other parts to the equation. And like, what about the people cost? Uh, and what about the churn or risk cost as like technologies continue to evolve in the Hadoop ecosystem? So first it's MapReduce, then it's you know Pig and Hive and Taze and Storm and Spark and like you pick you know your week and you can name a technology that was, that was like the it technology. Then you need the people that are masters of those technologies and they have to keep up with it. Um, so I think that the people part is not not close to being solved. There is a potential solution coming, though. Um, it's, I don't know if you've heard about this thing. It's called the cloud. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be big. Uh, and so I think that a lot of the improvements that we've seen in the app, in the app space for transactional applications are actually going to be moving to the cloud. And so some of these problems, not all of them, end up you know, getting simpler as you move things to the cloud. At least that's kind of my working mm -hmm. premise nowadays. What is it that, uh, I mean, you, you can sort of forklift, you know, lift and shift um, what you've got on-prem to the cloud, and the, you'll have the same operational challenges. But obviously, if you're in a new distribution channel and you have, you know, the ability to, to automate the operation, give us, you know, what you're thinking about with um, technologies that SnapLogic would be integrating with, where you think that, cloud deployments have the potential to reduce the 
operational overhead? Yeah, so you know, it's a, it's a it's a good question. So like you look at the the cost of you know uh, of operating a Hadoop environment. There's kind of two dimensions to that, right? So one one would be um, the uh, upfront cost, like the pure like sort of data center cost. So what are the promises of Hadoop? Well, elastic scalability. Yeah. Now, uh, your first day on the job, I said, okay, we're, we're going to be elastic. Now, go set up your data center like to be elastic. It's like, well, we still need all these physical nodes, even though we're like very virtualized, containerized, right, right. Uh, lots of eyes. Uh, um, but we need to set up our like physical machines, rack and stack everything. Uh, I need to be a master of all the administrative tools, so I need to be like into Zookeeper and all my you know sort of management tools. Um, I need to know how to diagnose and fix problems as they come up because I have nodes that go down and disks that go down, et cetera, or things that are underperforming. So in some ways, like you know, a blackout is easier than a brownout. It's like, well, this thing's underperforming for some reason. I'm not getting like my disk read speed that I think I should be. I got to go fix it. Like, why deal with any of that, right? So, you know, the whole the whole premise is, look, if you want an elasticity at, like, possibly a much greater scale than you can get, like, by building it out on premise, um, then, you know, if my nominal run rate is, like, you know, I scale out over, say, like, 10 nodes, which actually for most people I would say is sufficient. But every once in a while I want to burst to 100 nodes or 1,000 nodes, that's very difficult for most enterprises to take on. Like that's a lot of racks, that's a lot of electricity, that's a lot of everything. So you have to you know, first deal with that operational, um, those operational issues. Then I think the thing that actually makes it possible, which actually made you know, a lot of the you know, kind of um, separation of interests, like NoSQL databases for quickly persisting, and like Hadoop databases and analytic databases for doing you know, anal analytics, um, the thing that makes all that work is something like snap logic right so you need glue that ties it together you need you know on premise things connected to the cloud in the case of cloud analytics or other cloud applications connected to cloud analytics or you need things to tie your different like ins instances of transactional databases and analytic databases and that's kind of where we see ourselves uh, fit fitting in so we try to make it all easy so a couple years ago, whatever, maybe it was three or four years ago now, somebody came up with the concept of data lakes. And said, yeah. Great, put all your data in the data lake and no schema on right, just dump it in there and then we'll magically, you know, get, you'll get access to it and all the wonderful things will happen. And what seemed to happen was, first of all, you had lots of data lakes, and then, but there was value in that it was cheaper than sticking it in your enterprise data warehouse. But Modulo the previous discussion, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly. So, okay, so what's the right strategy for customers to take in terms of whatever, some people hate the term, some people love the term, what should people do? Yeah, and I'm somewhere in between. Uh, right. So I, I think, first of all, like a lot of things we're seeing, like what's, you know, old is new again. So this idea of like a data lake, if you turn the clock back even further, it's like when IBM first popularized like data warehousing. Um, you know, the idea was so big, it almost like kind of killed the whole industry before it even got started. Like this idea of the galactic data warehouse. And customers were sold, and maybe it was actually more practical back in the mainframe days where you had like, kind of like co-location of all your transactional applications. Why not build something that's sitting right next to it that actually is used for analysis? But it turned out we didn't really have the horsepower to do it. So um, I think this idea of dumping everything in one place is like seductive in a lot of ways. Like, hey, wouldn't it be great if I had all of my information in one place and then just like, you know, all these insights are gonna just come like bursting out of this. I won't even be able to contain it. And then you see what the reality is, which is like how do people really work? Um, so they put it into a data lake um, or whatever they call a data lake. And all of a sudden, the data starts, um, you know, kind of uh, evolving, right? So I have this data is derived from this data is derived from this data, and then it forks, et cetera. And I tell you to like build a report on something on this on this data set, and you say, well, there's 50 of them. Um, like, which one do I actually pick? It's like, well, that one was created by this like maniac, and that one was created by a guy in another group, and that one was that one's the right one for now. But then tomorrow <laughs> it might be it might be different. So Ask what we Joe. So what we think is that you actually need to really think about the organization within your data lake. Like it's sort of, um, you know, if you just put it in as a, you know, like an NFS drive or something and you dump everything there with like no metadata and no organization, it's going to be lousy. 
Um, so you need, uh, first of all, tools to help you organize it. So you know, I think that you can think about it as like zones within your data lake, like the raw the raw data. You know, something I don't I don't have like a good terminology, so I'll see, give you my like crummy terminology. Uh, so purified and what I call bottled. And it doesn't matter how many zones you have, but you need kind of rules like data SLAs that indicate you know, how structured are things. Like some should be completely schema on read. Um, there are parts of it where you don't want to keep like re-implementing schema like every time you read data, which a lot of analytics tools actually want and need. And like the type, uh, the type system actually is your friend in some cases and a foe in other cases. Mm -hmm. And you need tools that sort of help you define and marshal the data through and allow you to subscribe to the data. So when I think of like kind of our vision for how we build, you know, build out the data lake, um, it's not just, you know, populating is fun, it's important. Um, brokering out of the data lake is you know, fun and important. Uh, but actually management within the data lake I think is going to be critically important. Let me ask kind of a couple of uh, sort of different dimensions that you were talking about. Um, that uh, one of the benefits of, this, of the data lake was, was sort of uh, schema on read, you know, let's just put it all in there and then we'll figure out what questions we want to ask. Um, and also, um, we're trying to sort of collapse the amount of time between when we sort of ingest the data and, and then when we can analyze it and make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, so in that respect, it's sort of very different from the traditional ETL tool. Yeah. So <laughs> tell us more about how you, how the sort of origin story came about that was different, you know, not just cloud on-prem, but to take advantage of these other changes. Yeah, if we can, you maybe, that. Yeah, maybe we can tease apart the two things. Yeah. I think schema on read is kind of big. Yeah. Uh, I think snap logic origin is like pretty big. Okay. Uh, so let me like at least deal with the you know, schema on read, which okay. might be like more generally like you know applicable. And I'm happy to talk about snap logic. So schema on read, I think, is like is is amazing. So when you think about impedance uh, in like data warehousing. You have like one of the reasons why we didn't have these cool collections of data like all all along was the fact that you know, how did it work before you know so even like you know go go back to like early versions of data warehousing like you know DB2 mainframe or other things and they were you know, very strongly typed and you had strong schema and the general pattern was you'd have like a bunch of um, like the you know data architects they probably weren't called that back in the day I don't know what they were called. Um, uh, I do have gray hair, but not that much. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so they um, they would go away and they would come up with the schema that was supposed to like span everything because you needed a schema to slot things in. Uh, and we were coming out of the world like the uh, the VSAM world where you know typing wasn't impor as important and you could have these generalized buckets of things. And so everybody felt like everything had to be typed so you could query it primarily later. Um, so it was great, except. By the time that they actually came up with that schema, your business problem would have changed, your source systems changed, everything changed, and it was like completely freaking worthless, right? So, um, so schema on read is good because you know in some cases, the time value of that data is so low. Um, if you take the time to create a schema for it, it's done. Like if you think about IoT and other things. So um, the other thing is that um, in the time it takes to come up with that schema, just even when the time value of the data isn't low, your business requirements might have changed, and schema used to really define queryability and what you could do with it. So a few things have changed. So we have this fast unload mechanism. It's a little bit of kicking the can down the road because you have to face these problems at some point. Like there's, you know, reconciling like 120 different finance systems doesn't get solved by schema and read. It just gets like, you know, you just push the problem. Just avoid to some, doing it now. Yeah, you just sort of solve it like somewhere somewhere but else. There's value in doing that because if you did it in the warehouse with the first, where you first land your decision support data, you know, you've sort of, you've sort of obviated a whole bunch of questions that if you want to go back and ask later, you have to bring all the new stuff. I, I, I couldn't agree more. There's so much value in having all the data and actually, you know, you can credit even guys like Teradata, you know, for saying this all along, it's like don't don't compress your data, don't abbreviate your data, don't yeah. aggregate your data, just have the data and then figure it out. Now you can look at the economics and everything, but you know that that part was absolutely right, and that's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you want to understand the differences between the systems, and sometimes you want it all unified, and there's really kind of value in both. 
So just you know, on the Snap Logic side, I think that you know, there's a few a few things that we kind of figured figured out. Like one was everything is moving to the cloud. You know, first operational stuff, which was where we got our start. Um, so, so we wanted a completely like cloud first experience. Uh, we wanted to do a great job of integrating cloud applications. It turns out that they're all document based for the most part through their interfaces. Like so, you have a REST interface that spits out a JSON document. And when you looked at like kind of previous generation technologies, they were all row and column. And so they would, they would be great tools as long as you didn't mind cramming all of your documents into a row and column model. And so when you talk about this impedance mismatch, you had it right out of the box with these, with these technologies because I had to take my data that I understood, put it into a format that I no longer understood, and then maybe actually put it back into some you know, third format later and so there was this huge impedance mismatch, in my view, at every step of the way. It takes longer to build connectors in that model. Uh, it takes longer um, to, you know, for customers to deploy because they would have this on-premise deployment model. Like I have to install software on everybody's desktop. It's like, no, just say no to all these things. Um, it's like, look, if you have an impedance mismatch, fix that. Um, if you have a deployment problem, fix that. And so, uh, Snap Logic just went head at these problems and said, we're going to just change the way everybody thinks about integration. So that's, it, that, that's the story. And so what do you sell? A platform of tools or? Yeah, so we have, uh, like, you know, the, the, the message would be we have an integrated solution. Uh, it's an iPaaS solution, mm -hmm. meaning that um, we are delivered, yeah, our design experience is delivered from the cloud. You can deploy on-premise or in the cloud. And we integrate. Um, so we do application integrations, like say you want to, you know, attach NetSuite to Salesforce.com. Uh, we we do that, and that's, that was actually kind of the origin of the company. Now we're getting more into like what you'd consider data integration, or looking at sets of data for analytic purposes. So like taking, you know, my Twitter feed and my ERP data and some mainframe data, pulling it all together into Hadoop and saying, okay, what do I really have? So now we're looking at um, doing Hadoop integration, both in the cloud uh, and, and on-premise in your Hadoop instance. And I access that in your cloud or who's ever cloud? Well, well, it depends on what you mean by access. So like in terms of design experience, it's our cloud. Right. So we host on Amazon. You get it fr from there. Again, no, no download for anything. Yeah. Um, but your data stays wherever you want it to be. So if you never want it to touch the cloud, it never touches the cloud. It runs completely behind your firewall. If you want to run on AWS or in other cloud platforms, yeah, we can deploy to like to AWS, or we can have our own like integration service uh, that also runs in uh, both Amazon and a hosted service. Um, you can you can kind of run it wherever Whatever you want, want. for da for data privacy reasons. That's right. All right, James, we're out of time, but I'll give you the last word on. Uh on whatever you like, I mean, the Strata Hadoop world, sort of Snap Logic, your vision, give us a bumper sticker. All right, well, that's that's pretty broad. I like it. Uh, so, well, I think you know, to me, no I always, schema yeah, on yeah, right. yeah, yeah, no, 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 no schema for this talk. So, um, well, I think that the big question is always like, what do we want to do with data? Like, I think you know, at various times, it's easy to get mired in like the like myopic issues of you know, how do I operate this. Yeah, what's the latest like machine learning environment that I like need need to learn? It's all like exciting stuff, and we have this like toolbox like we've never had before. Now, what are we really trying to do? Um, you know, at the end of it. So, if we do our old analytics like more cheaply um, and quicker than we used to do, is that like good? Yeah, that's like good, but it's not that exciting. Like. Yeah, you know, I, I always ask the political question, like, are we better off now than we were like four years ago or whenever, you know, Hadoop you investment. That debate. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was told not to like mention like names, but at least you know that, that idea is like good. Um, and so um, I don't know, like after billions of dollars of like, you know, VC money and others that have poured into this that we're really better off yet. Um, so the question is what would make us better off? Yeah, I think um, non-deterministic analytics like around machine learning and AI are at, are excellent. Um, I actually, you know, still have this like weird utopian like vision for where everything goes, which is when you really think about like data utopia, what do you what do you think about? You know, just think about like questions that you might ask, like you know, air quality, like you know, sort of um, like statistics about like passengers that you're flying next to on the airplane that you're allowed to like know about. Just like there's so much like every day, every minute, every second information that you don't really have easy access to. 
And then you look at enterprise questions about like their customers or their products. Um, and all these questions that we should have better answers for, we don't. And I think a lot of it has to do with like data availability and our ability to combine that data together. So when I think about the vision of data, you know, you think about like kind of third party stores for data. All, all subject to privacy and everything, you know, um, means. Um, and then the ability to combine it with uh, data that you know something about. And really kind of thinking about like solving like more, you know, problems with data and what, you know, how we further eliminate the impedance behind uh, some, of, some of those challenges. And I think that that's kind of where things head. I actually think, you know, Hadoop plays a part in this. And I think that integration technologies like SnapLogic have a big role in getting that data together and combining it in meaningful ways so that we can answer those questions. So that's a key step to realizing that vision. James, thanks very much for coming in theCUBE. Very appreciate it. Great, thanks for having me, thanks. guys. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from the Big Apple. We'll be right back.